Okay, so this suburb, suburb due diligence is once you actually select your one to three target suburbs, how do you then study those suburbs and become an expert? Get to know, get underneath the skin of a suburb and basically get to truly know what it's all about. Now, just um, before I go on to that, if anybody is having trouble on their step number one, where they go through and they start the culling process and you're stuck, who are you going to call? Renovating profit office, okay? So we want to make sure that you're progressing through the step-by-step -step system. So if you're stuck, please ask for help. It's there, definitely there to help you. All right. So when you're looking at an individual suburb, once you've decided you're one to three target suburbs, what you need to do is you need to become an expert at it. And there's a couple of things that you need to look at. You need to look at the suburb attributes in terms of what are the positive and the negative factors associated with that suburb. You need to look at the demographics of who's actually buying in that suburb, the housing types, the style of housing within that suburb, and also the supply and the demand patterns within those suburbs. So if you can nail those four things, you'll be on your way to becoming a suburb, ex a suburb expert. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this again on a macro level and look at drill it down to a micro level now the reality is with step number two and step number three you're probably going to do this in sync with each other in some respects okay so what you need to do is you need to allow that 12 to 16 weeks to become an expert in your property due diligence and your suburb due diligence so this is the reason why I say please don't walk out of this workshop on Monday afternoon and ring me up and say Cherie I've just bought an unrenovated property okay I'll absolutely scream and uh, I know this sounds stupid but I've had students who've done that numerous students who've done that um, and it, it frustrates me because they've just skipped everything that I've taught them to do so it is you've got to be disciplined in this okay all right so I'm going to teach you about 40 ways that you can become an expert in your suburb first one if finances allow live in your suburb if you live in the suburb, you're going to truly discover what people do there, how they live, what they do in the morning and the afternoon. You're going to just know everything. You're going to uncover by living in the suburb which streets, which look to be quiet streets, suddenly become busy streets at 7 till 9 in the morning and from 5 to 7 p.m. in the afternoon. You're going to know which street attract noise that you don't necessarily see at all times of the day. I'll just give you an example. When I first started studying Balmain, there were a group of properties, some waterfront properties that were a lot lower value and it was actually like a couple of streets that had a lot lower value but they were in a prime location and I couldn't work out why on earth these properties had lower value and it wasn't until I dug into the suburb a little bit um, later that I realized that at 10 o'clock every single night the P&O ports you know that big um, birthing facility down near Anzac Bridge where they load all the new cars um, basically at 10 o'clock every night there was this shunting noise that came on so all of those properties within the immediate streets were all affected by noise late at night when people were going to bed they therefore had lower property values now most people wouldn't uncover this in their due diligence but this is why if you live in the suburb it's much easier to identify these quirky things that could trip you up later down the line so if your suburbs if your finances are live in it okay because then you will truly become a suburb expert um, start spending time in the suburb so if you can't live in the suburb and you don't want to upheave your family that's fine that's cool but at the very least start spending time in the suburb so just start driving in the car like it's amazing what you can learn by just driving around the streets in the suburbs I do this all over the country whenever I fly interstate to um, speak um, if time allows I will actually meet up with graduates in Perth South Australia whatever it may be um, there's been many occasions where I've had a couple of students who have been struggling a little bit so I said look okay I'll spend half a day with you um, if I've got half a day to kill uh, before I fly in and I've driven around like I sit in the car all I need to do is spend a couple of hours driving around being being chauffeured around I'll say look this suburb is this this and this these are the factors you need to look for so you can learn a lot just by getting in your car driving the streets okay so start spending time in the suburbs a very quick way to learn if you're in any of those lifestyle suburbs just sit in the cafes order yourself a coffee sit out on the sidewalk and look at the types of people going backwards and forwards like who are the demographics so people watching within those suburbs okay Obtain mats from your local council. Now, remember this morning I said that when you're setting up your property business, one of the things that you want to do is actually start um, allocate a little portion of your house to your new property business. Do you remember that? Okay, so one of the things um, would be great for you is to actually get maps of your local suburb and actually hang them in your home office at, at, um, at home. So when you have these maps, it also puts you in the frame of mind that you actually do have a property business. So I'm going to go with you the different maps that you can actually get from your local council. So go into your local 
local council. Now, I guarantee you when you go in, they'll say we don't have any maps. Um, when I went into my council uh, 10 years ago, they um, pretty much said to me, oh, no, we don't have any maps. And I said, well, what that map on the wall over there, do you have that? And they were like, oh, I'll just check for you. So they made a phone call upstairs, and guess what? The maps were available. So these are those maps that I bought 10 years ago. Um, so I'll go through these different types of maps. So if, if you, and I did actually go into the council with my Wagga student, and she was told exactly the same thing. When we looked through their, their binder on the counter, I said, what about this map here? And she said, oh, I'll phone upstairs, same thing. And they were able to photocopy it for like $10. They blew it up onto like one of these sizes. So if for some reason you can't get these maps, then in the local environmental plan, the LEP DCP, which you can download from the internet for all of your councils, you can actually print out an A4 sheet. You can take it into like um, office works and get it blown up for about 10 bucks if worse comes to worse. Okay. So this first map is what's called a residential density map. And basically what this is showing is that what streets have, uh, you know that floor to space ratio where I said, you know, floor to space ratio is the amount of house that you're allowed on your land. This map shows you what the percentages are. So every suburb is different right across Australia for the density that you're allowed on your, house, on your block of land. So what this map is showing is that all these properties right here. So can I have one of the crew come up and help me with this map if that's possible? Two crew members? Um, so what this map is showing is that in Balmain, this is Balmain here, and what it's saying is 0.7. So 0.7 equals what? How much what percentage? 70%. So you're allowed to have houses here that are 70%. So thank you. Thanks, Helen. Thanks. I'm definitely not a good map girl. Um, so what it's saying here is that these properties, this whole pocket here, you're allowed to develop 70% of your land is allowed to have physical house bought, um, built on it, okay? Over here, 0.5. So this is all Roselle. Roselle is 0.5, which means that you're only allowed to build 50% of your land. Now, in some streets here, on one side of the street, and oh, that's actually a bad street to choose, but um, here. Now here, uh, what's this? This is Lilyfield. In Lilyfield, it's 0.6, 60% to 1. Now what it means is here, this line is actually cutting right through the guts of the street. So on one side of the street, you're allowed to develop 60%. On the other side of the street, you're allowed to develop 50%. Now do you think the property values on one side of the street are going to be slightly higher than the other property values? Okay. If you don't know your suburb due diligence and your property due diligence, this is where you can get tripped up by an unrenovated property on the wrong side of the street and think you're going to sell it for a certain price and you're not because these have much, um, much higher density of buildings on these streets. Yes? Oh, hey there. Um, I'm just wondering, that ratio, if you're going up a level, so uh, you're using 50% off the land, but over two levels. It's total, total floor it's area. Total. So it doesn't all matter right. if it's a five-story building, they count all the individual rooms. Yep. Okay, so it's a total. And we're going to talk about this in detail because this is a um, floor to space ratio is a pretty important calculation. Thank but you. yeah, it's the total house, the total area of the house. Okay, so that's a really great map for you to um, be able to. And this map is great for structural renovations where you're going to quickly work out what you can build. So if Chris, the real estate agent, says to me, Shri, a 200 square meter block of land comes up, I'll say, Chris, where is it? It's in Rosa Street. I know Rosa Street. I know I can automatically develop 0.7. So, okay, I'll go, Chris, 200 square meter block, 200 times 0.7 is I'm allowed to have 140 square metres of house. I'll quickly look up the floor plans, calculate the area. It's 80 square metre house currently. I'm allowed 140. That means I can get a structural alteration on there of 60 to 60 square metres. I'm interested in looking at it further. So it's like really easy once you, can, once you understand these basic things. And obviously, it'll be a matter of time before you can sort of become up to speed like I am. But without these sorts of maps, it becomes a lot harder for you to be able to do that unless you have the DCP. All right, so I'll, I'll drop that one, gals. This is a little, uh, this one is not so much. Uh, yeah, that's a good one, but we won't do that now. All right. Okay, this is a really important map, and most of you will be able to get your hands on this. This is what's called a zoning map. All right. Now, what this does, this map lists for the suburb, um, it lists down all the pockets of residential, industrial, commercial, business. So in this map, uh, pink is all residential houses. Now, do you think, see here, Ballast Point, Snails Bay, all this area, see how they've got a higher proportion of parks here? This is the posh part of Balmain, okay? It's because it's, it's got, you know, all the water and it's got a high concentration of parks, which are a lifestyle facility, okay? So when Chris, the real estate agent, rings me and says, Cherie, um, number 16, um, Cameron Street has come up, 
I know. And when you spend, sorry, and when, I'm diverting a little bit. When you spend time in the suburb driving around the streets, you'll get to the point where you don't need a street director anymore, okay? You'll just know where Elliott Street is, Cameron Street, and so forth. So when Chris, the real estate agent, rings you and says, Shri, an unrenovated house has come up number 16 Cameron Street, I can quickly look at my own home office. So I'm sitting down at my desk in my home office, and these maps are in the wall in front of me. I know that Rosa Street's here. I'll go, ooh, um, or Cameron Street, whatever it may be, I'll go, ah, uh, geez, Chris, it's really close to the industrial activity. I don't think so, but look, I'll quickly jump in the car, I'll quickly jump on Google Earth, whatever it may be, and I'll have a quick look for you. But at this early stage, I'm probably saying no because it's, it's located to an adverse development. Can you see how I look, I sound professional? All by just having like these basic tools like a map at my disposal. Um, obviously, all the blue is the um, retail, all the lifestyle facilities. So you can clearly see on these maps where all the lifestyle facilities are. Huh? So I know that all these properties along here are properties we're going to buy or not? No, because they're all flanking that retail strip that I just told you not to buy, okay? All of these properties that flank the commercial, act the re commercial retail activity here, what happens is they sell, they sell at a lot lower property value and they also take a lot longer to sell because the major buyer objection of the traffic and the congestion and the the bugs and the rats from all the cafe and the food scraps, um, people see them as a major buyer objection and they just won't buy. So what you find is people who buy are the people that are so desperate to be in the suburb that they'll just put up with all of that stuff who are capped at an affordability level and just want to get in or just people who've done no due diligence whatsoever. So that's what you don't want to be aiming for. Okay, so that's a really good map. Um, to basically have, and I'd probably say out of all of these maps, that's probably the most important map that you want to be aiming for, the zoning map. This one is uh, foreshore building line. Now, if you're dealing with peninsula suburbs where they're close to water, what this is saying is that when you have um, some suburbs you go to are what's called an integrated development, and an integrated development is where you need the approval from not only the council, but another government department. So for example, if a roundabout is going in, your, if there's proposed plans for a roundabout, you need to get approval from the RTA. Um, any of these properties where they're located, like waterfront sort of properties, they also need the permission of the waterways as well. So any of these properties basically mark it as saying you don't need council approval, you also need to get the approval of another government department. So expect delays on those properties, okay? Particularly our places like RTA and waterways, okay? So it's just highlighting. So if Chris the agent called me and said, look, you know, number six Water Street, I could quickly go to this map and go, oh, I'd put that in the too hard basket potentially. So um, that's another good map. This one's a great map. If you're dealing with those inner city um, heritage and conservation suburbs or if you're dealing with those metropolitan heritage and, heritage and conservation suburbs where there's a conservation overlay, this map basically identifies where the conservation blanket is, okay? So you can see here that literally the whole of Balmain has got, see that blanket, that green, that green shade? A blanket has been thrown over. So basically all of these properties here are going to have tougher development controls over them. If I buy a property in this, side, this part of Roselle, which is all that area behind Balmain Legs Club and headed down towards the water, they have got a lot less relaxed control. So it's going to be much easier to get a property through here, a lot less um, quicker and probably less issue than properties over here. Also, this map is particularly good. Sorry, Helen, I know I'm standing right in front of you. Um, these properties are also particularly good for um, highlighting where heritage listed properties are. Now, sometimes you may go and buy a property, let's say an unrenovated, I owned one of these ones here, which is that um, two and a half million dollar house. Um, sometimes you'll buy an unrenovated property in close proximity, it might be like five doors up from a heritage listed item, but sometimes the council will actually say, because you're close to a heritage listed item, they might put some more onerous development conditions on you because there's a heritage listed property close by. So this map actually helps you identify where those heritage listed properties are and where they sit in relation to the property that you're looking at. Uh, yes, that one's... And we're going to hang all these up for you two outside. Um, this one's called a heritage conservation map. Now, other little funny ones. Um, so th there's all sorts of maps that you can get from your local council. Like this, I don't know where I picked this up from, but this is like a bike map. Um, so in a West bike map. So I may not be able to glean a lot of information from this, but I, you never know. So try and collect as much as you can, like all these quirky little things, stick them on the wall, because when you have all of these maps in one little corner of your garage that you've just set up as your property and your new property office, it will put you in the mindset that you're now starting to become a property developer who's taking this seriously. So it all helps. Thank you, girls. You've been wonderful map holders.
Okay. Okay. And those maps, um, you know, don't cost much money. $10, 15 $20 a map, they're not expensive. Okay, in terms of your suburb, determine the population of your suburb. You don't want to go into suburbs basically where they have 900 people, okay? So you need to make sure that the, the suburb is robust in terms of the number of people actually living there. Now, how you do this is you get on um, sites like My RP Data. Um, you can also do suburb... Pro uh, sorry, uh, uh, you can also get on suburb... Um, uh, you can type into the internet. Let's do one now so I can give you a practical example. Let's type in... And they're really easy to do. So basically you're looking for demographic reports. Now, you might think, oh, demographic reports, that's pretty boring. But you need all this information to start to build your finance proposals, your suburb due diligence, which I'm going to teach you through. So you, again, you only need to do this once and it's done. So type in, and I'm hoping this works, Balmain Demographics. Okay, and let's see what comes up. Balmain suburb profile. Select Balmain. So see how it brings up some of this data? See? So they're really easy to find. So just Google your, once you've determined your suburbs, Type in um, demographic reports for yours, like, you know, um, Highgate, you know, for the people in Brisbane, Highgate demographics, whatever it is your suburb, just type in the suburb name, demographic reports, and you'll start to pull up all of these sorts of um, stats in terms of what the population is. So the reason why you need to search for your population is just to make sure that you are going to have a long-term business in that suburb, one where there's stock turning over continuously. I'll take a question while I'm fumbling around on this one. Um, what you were just talking about maps before, is there a, a ratio between the setback you have to have that a council gives you and the size of the block? Do they Absolutely. There is. So most councils have a 900 mil setback. Certainly in a city locations, it tends to be a 900 mil setback from the boundary. But as you move into outer suburbs, that becomes a lot more respe um, relaxed. So every suburb is different. But yes, most councils, um, I don't know any council that will let you build boundary to boundary. So there's not always a setback. No, I mean, as in, is there a, when you're talking about maps, is there a map that just like you've got the Oh, ratio? a setback map. No, um, not that I've seen, but that's all contained in your LEP, DCP. Lisa, can I get somebody to um, just go through uh, my manuals down here and pull out the LEP, DCP so I can pass that around? So the LEP, DCP, does everybody know what that is? Okay, so um, you're going to learn lots of um, acronyms in this business as well. So one of them is LEP, which stands for Local Environmental Plan. Um, so it's the Green Book, Camille, you know, the Green Bible, Council Bible, and um, DCP, which is Development Control Plan. So if you're going to be a pr property developer, um, when I say developer, I mean developer or renovator, um, what you need to do is probably worthwhile spending the $100. You can download it free from the internet, or you can actually buy it from the council nicely bound. I just chose to buy mine um, from the council. So it looks good. So that will actually tell you what the setbacks are for even like certain streets within your suburbs. So it just it's the, the rule book. And once you know the rules, then it's basically um, very easy to follow that. OK, so in terms of your, your data profile and the population of your suburb, you get that from places like MyIP Data. You can go into domain.com.au, type in your suburb. It'll bring all the demographic reports up for you. And they're all free. You only have to do that once. Okay, count the number of real estate agencies in your suburb. So again, if there's multiple agencies, it means there is enough stock turning over into the business. I'll do a search for you on RP Data. I'll give you an example. Would anybody like me to do a search for them on how um, a suburb that they're thinking about doing? Yep. Wollongong? Okay, so Wollongong's a pretty big area. That's more a region. Ostermere? Okay, so let's go into RP Data. We'll do a search. So Tim, we're going to do a search. That's right, Tim? So, yep. Okay, you come into uh, my RP data, um, New South Wales ownership. I'm going to come down into quick reports. So we're going to do a suburb report. And is Ostimi spelled A U S T I M E R? Start again. What is it? Okay, cool. Is that right? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a suburb report. We're going to see how many... Um, no, that's the... Really double E? Oh, yes. 
We'll give that a whirl. Still doesn't look right, but... Oh, we are right. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're going in, we're pulling up all the sales in Ostomy. I have no idea where it is, but it sounds um, exotic. Um, <laughs> we're going to do a search for the last 12 months, see how many properties have actually sold in the last 12 months in that particular suburb. So we're going to backdate this to the first of the first, uh, let's say, 2010. Uh, let's actually, no, let's date it from the 14th. So the 14th of the 5th. 2010 to the 14th of the 5th, 2001 year of data. Um, we're going to get it in square metres and we're just looking for residential single dwellings. Okay, so you can actually narrow your search down because you don't, if you don't narrow your search down, you're going to get apartments or semis, um, land subdivisions, all sorts of things. So narrow it down and we're going to press submit and we're going to see how many properties have actually stopped. Now, as a very minimum, you don't want to go into suburbs where they don't have at least, at the very minimum, at least 100 properties turning over each year. So this is actually saying that there's no properties that actually sold in. What is it? Is it like, like five houses there or something? or <laughs> Big suburb? Tiny suburb? So very tightly held. Okay, so we'll do Cook's Hill. So what it's saying is that no property was actually sold in the last 12 months. Not right? All right, let's do another suburb. Hang on, sorry, hang on. Is that in New South Wales or ACT? Yeah. Okay, Gwynville, can you spell it for me? Yep. Okay, so we're going to backdate it. Five, um, 2010. Actually, I didn't change that, so maybe that was one reason why it didn't actually come out. 1405, 2010. Okay, meter squared, single residential dwellings, residential only. Let's see what it brings up. Where are these suburbs? Sorry, did you say in Wollongong? Okay. Let's do one we know of, okay, in Sydney. <laughs> okay. We'll do Lane Cove. Because if it brings up zero, we know something's definitely wrong with it. Okay. Okay, Lane Cove, 5,000. Um, backdate this to 1405, 2010. 1405, 2010. Okay, meters. No, because we're doing one year's history. So we're taking it from 14th to the 5th, 2010 to the 14th to the 5th, 2000. So we're just looking at the past 12 months' history. Because what we're just trying to determine how many properties actually sell each year. So if you do anything longer than that, it's not a true reflection. Um, single residential dwelling, residential. Okay, I must be doing something wrong. Hang on, what's down there? Sorry, what's that? Ah, oh, that's what it is. I don't think I can... Um, no, that, that, the, the street name automatically populates. It's not that. So I think maybe because we had a... I actually, I don't know what it is. Um, Sorry, what's that? Zero. Um, I just, it, it sh does, shouldn't really matter. Just let me do Balmain. It's the first time it's actually happened. All right. I'm not doing anything quirky, am I? No. Sale so price zero to nine nine, so that's all right. Um, sale date from 2010 to 2011. I'm going to do residential. Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay. 
We've got the RP data person coming in, so we'll, uh, we'll test it with them. Um, I don't know why those other suburbs went. That's the very first time that's ever happened. Um, and even still, this doesn't... Um, yeah. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> a Mac. I, did, I actually got a Mac. I got given a present, um, a Mac, last week. I have no idea how to use it. Um, still trying to work that one. Um, so what it's saying is that I, d I honestly don't know why that's the first time that's ever happened. So we'll ask the RP data. Maybe it's just something I'm doing. Um, but it's saying it's 126 properties have turned over. So what you want to do is you want to just do that basic search. So trust me, RP data is very good and it does work. Um, but what you want to do is you want to make sure that it's at least 100 properties turning over in your suburb as an absolute minimum, okay? Um, because reality is anything less than that, it means that you've only got you know, one or two properties coming on the market and maybe hard for you to do deals. All right. All right. So um, RP data is a priceless tool for be being able to determine that. Um, and you can also get that sort of stuff possibly free from the internet as well. Sorry, John, microphone, please. Yep, you're right. Hiya. Uh, is doing an RP data search free on the website or is that... No, um, so you need to subscribe to RP data. So okay. um, we will offer that to you. That's the only thing that you have the option of buying this weekend uh, this, in this course is the subscription to RP data. So we'll talk about that in step number three. Ah. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, so once you determine if there's enough stock turning over, then if there is enough stock, focus on that suburb. If there's not enough stock turning over, i.e. at least 100 properties a year, then move on. That, that suburb goes off your list, okay, and you focus on a different suburb. Okay, determine if vacant land is prevalent in your suburb. So again, Google Earth, um, driving around the streets, it will be able to tell you whether or not vacant land is actually prevalent in your suburb. Um, determine what the historical capital growth rate has been in your suburb. The reality is, is that you don't want to become a, an expert in a suburb that has had flat line growth over the last 10 years. You want to be going into a suburb that has been tracking steadily, consistently over the course of at least 10 years, okay? Um, the way, where you get all this information from is, again, is from my RP data. So if you go into domain.com.au or myrpdata.com, there's some stuff that you can download for free. Um, and it's certainly, you know, very prevalent over the internet for free. Um, these are the sorts of graphs that you're going to be dealing with. So you can see here that this is showing consistent growth in that direction. See this one here? A bit all over the place. It's still sort of tracking generally in the right direction. It's obviously a bit of a blip here, but you want to make sure that your suburb is just on the rise, not going the other way or flatlining consistently. Okay, magazines like Australian Property Investor Magazine are absolutely great for um, tracking historical capital growth rates. In fact, um, in Australian Property, do you all subscribe to this? Okay, it's a beautiful magazine. I'm in it um, in every month. Um, <laughs> and so you'll get the pleasure of looking at me every month. Um, but what they do is at the back, they actually have... They publish all the up-to-date capital growth rates um, historically for every single suburb in Australia. So you only have to pull these data out, again, rip it out, and it, this is the stuff that starts going into your finance reports, your valuers, due diligence, all those sorts of things I'm going to teach you about. Okay, so um, if your friends say to your family, say, what do you want for Christmas and you haven't got this, say a sub subscription to Property Investor Magazine. Um, you know, I try and read this still cover to cover, even with the breadth of knowledge that I have these days. I guarantee you I still get some really good tips every single month in one, one way, shape or form from those magazines. Okay. Determine, now you need to look at the historical capital growth rate. You also need to look at the future capital growth rates as well. You get those from Australian Property Investor Magazine or you get them on the free suburb reports um, on the internet for free. Okay, question at the back there. Oh, hi, my question goes back to the zoning map where you have the green space. Yes. I'm wondering with properties that actually border on the green space, would there be buyer objection resistance to that? Would it be seen as a plus or would it depend on what the green space actually is? Yeah, it would depend. Like there's some suburbs that are just small little parks with a swing and they're fine, but there's other parks that are f like football fields and, you know, people, um, you know, 200 people on a weekend going, yeah, whatever. Mm. So it depends on what the park is being used for. But generally parks are a positive valuer of property, not a negative. So, but just always do that double check. 
Okay, um, so determine what the future capital growth rate. So again, very easy to see off that information to make sure you're going to have a robust um, suburb moving forward. Um, determine who the demographics are living within the suburb. Now, this is really important. This is going to how you're going to distinguish who actually is buying in your suburb. So with these reports, um, they're just going to give you an, a glimpse of, of who the people are. And then what you're going to do, you're going to basically second that up by going through the open for inspections and doing those um, property inspections in step number three. So you want to work out who the buyers are and what they want. Now, the type of data here you need is um, population data. So quite often when you do these reports, they'll spit out all of this data in one report. And I would encourage you to actually get a number of reports. They're all free on the internet. So don't just base everything on one, what one company spits out. Print out about five of them and make sure they're all fairly consistent because sometimes the data that these companies get is skewed and it's just totally incorrect. So what you need to do is you need to find the population data. So you need to know how many males, how many females. Is it heavily skewed towards females? Is it heavily skewed to males? Whatever it may be. One of my targets at suburbs, Roselle has the highest proportion. I know many of you heard me speak about this in my preliminary seminar, but Roselle has the highest proportion of single females than in any other suburb of Australia. So as a renovator, knowing that um, it's very good chance that a female is going to buy the renovated property that I'm selling, then as a renovator, it tells me what I should be putting into that property. So renovators, you're all renovators now, what should you, if you know that a very good chance that an un, a female is going to buy your three bedroom unrenovated house that you're going to do a cosmetic renovation to, what are the things you're going to be putting inside that renovation to cater to her every woman need? Ensuite, big wardrobes. So you're going to do the big sex in the city wardrobes if space allows. Beautiful kitchen. Security. I mean, single females, they get scared. So they want, they want security on the front, security door on the front, on the back, and they want window locks and possibly even an alarm system. Storage. Yeah, we've got too many clothes. Yep. Bath. He said bath. I live in my bath. Um, so, and most people, ladies, do, we live in, do you live in your bath too? It's a female thing. So can you see, once you know who the demographics are, then those questions as to how you actually renovate your property become a lot easier. All right, so your population data actually helps you with that in some regard. Um, determine the types of household structures within your suburb. So this particular one is actually looking at what is the average person per household. Now in Balmain, it's saying that the average household size is 2.07, which means a couple, one kid. All right, and I know that's true. I know that most of the people in Balmain now um, was heavily dominated now by um, couples with one or two kitties. There's a baby boom that's been going on in Balmain for the last five years. So it just helps you understand what type of property you should be buying just based on, the, on these um, demographics as well. Okay, um, the type of household structure. So is it childless couples? Is it group households? Lone household? Is it single parents? Have a look at this in Balmain. 33% of households are single parents. That's interesting, isn't it? So as renovators, what would you think? Is there an opportunity there or what? They must all be renovators. All renovators? <laughs> Any opportunity there? If you look at it, um, couples, childless couples, 26%, couples with children, single parents. So for me, 33, a big chunk of Balmain is single parents. So I'm thinking, okay, well, who's the single parents? Mothers and a child. So do you think security is going to be an issue? You know, high priority. Do you think, you know, they want to be out mowing the lawn on a weekend? Low maintenance gardens. Okay, so like once you understand who the demographics are, it's very easy to create your product to suit their needs. Okay, determine the types of household structures. Now, people owning, like, what is the proportion in your suburb? Is it mainly owner-occupiers? Is it renters? What is it? Um, you want to aim for suburbs that the higher proportion of owner-occupiers, the better. The more owner-occupiers, the more desirable the suburb is because owner-occupiers take more pride in their appearance than renters do. That's a reality. So you don't want to go into suburbs where it's all renters because it's almost like a gentrification suburb where it's just not going to look very nice. So the higher the owner-occupier ownership, the better for you. So what it's saying here is that 50, 54% of people um, in Balmain pretty much are owner-occupiers, so that's a nice split. Okay. Determine the types of occupations of the people living within your suburb. So what it's saying is okay, it'll break down with these demographic reports. Is it, is it blue collar workers? Is it white collar workers? Professionals? What is it? Again, you can really identify who are the demographics living within your suburb. So what it's pretty much saying is that 
60, 64% of people living in Balmain are, prof are professionals, management people. Um, I was told, I'm not sure if it's exactly correct, but I was told that Balmain um, it has the highest proportion of affluent young professionals than in any other suburb in Australia as well. So again, so money's there. Um, so you, you know, obviously in my suburb, people will spend the money. All right, um, determine the level of education. So this goes through um, whether, again, blue collars, university degree, qualified people. This one you're used to a lesser degree. This one's not so relevant, but it's still good to know um, how educated the people are in your area. I guess you probably want to know this because um, that'll sort of, I guess, on the flip end when they're buying it, you, it will sort of, sort of set you in some respect of understanding how hard the sale is going to be. The more educated somebody is, the more questions you're going to get as well. The less educated, um, you may be able to um, get away with more. So that's reality. Not, you know, get away with more in a bad way, but... Okay, determine the ages of the people living within your suburb. Now, the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics, is absolutely great for pulling demographic detail in terms of the age of people. We know as renovators, what age group are we targeting? 25 to 45 year age group is where you want to be. So what it's saying in my suburb is that... Two, four... So literally the whole suburb is within... Um, you know, the, the, literally the whole suburb was, is within that um, 25 to, you know, under 45 age group, which is where you want to be. Um, okay. Determine the employment status of local residents. Okay. So are they unemployed or are they unemployed? You want to go into suburbs where the majority of people are employed because at the end of the day, housing affordability, if they're not got a job, they're not going to be buying any house. So very quick check. Okay, determine the income affordability levels. Now, this one goes through what the actual disposable income is for people living within your suburb. So, again, this is really great for um, finance proposals and your, particularly your finance proposals in terms of people being able to afford your renovated property as well. You'll use this to a lesser degree, but it's a good check just to go over. Um, determine the nationality. Now, this is a really important one. Um, this actually breaks down of the people living in your suburb, which country are they from? Now, this, the reality is, is that, you know, particularly in, in New South Wales, we use it as an example, there's a lot of um, communities that hu are hub together. Um, you know, if we look at it on a broad perspective, you know, suburbs like Cabramatta, um, Chinatown obviously have very strong um, Asian nationalities. Um, you go out to places like Lakemba, very strong uh, Lebanese community. So you can um, basically uh, identify these clusters of communities that live together. Now, why this is important is that you'll pull up your demographic report. And let's say you've got a high proportion of Lebanese people living in your particular target suburb. Now, Lebanese people as a nationality, what do you think, so knowing that you're going to be renovating a house that's probably going to be sold to a Lebanese family, how would you go about, or what would you put in that renovation to cater to that nationality? A prayer room. A prayer room? I don't know if I would go into a prayer room. Maybe. Lots of bedrooms, yes, big families with Lebanese. So, you know, obviously bigger homes and they also have a lot of visitors where they just congregate, they basically sit together in a big room. So when you're dealing with unrenovated houses to a particular nationality like Lebanese, um, Italian, they do a lot of entertaining. So that then calls for open plan living dining rooms where you've got bigger spaces rather than small individual confined rooms, okay? Can you see once you understand how just those things become a little bit easier? So, you know, yeah, this is a little bit boring to do this sort of stuff, but as I said, you only have to do it once. Okay, determine the dominant religion of local residents. Now, this one I haven't, to be honest with you, I haven't had to use this one in any way, shape or form over the last 10 years, and you probably won't have it to either, but it's good just to get it anyway. Is there any um, factors, any, can anybody think of a reason why you would need to um, consider um, religion? Some, some nationalities, uh, I'm not going to say, because uh, I don't want to get myself into trouble, but um, some nationalities will be a little bit harder to get money out of. Um, what's that? Yep, could be. Yeah, mosque and stuff like that. Yep, absolutely. Okay, cool. 
All right, um, so all of that detail, you can get it from the ABS. Um, the ABS has got so much information. At the ABS, it is a headache to go through it. Um, if you want to kill a couple of hours, then certainly drill down. You can get right down to absolute grass levels, but quite often they have high-level reports that you can pull for free from the internet. So you only have to do it once, it's done, and you're going to use that moving forward in everything. For anybody that's looking at doing spotters fees, where you basically go and match people to properties, um, you're going to have to go and do this suburb due diligence, because when you're pulling together, your spotters fee, your spotters report with your suburb and your property due diligence sections, you're going to need all these demographic details to justify the property to a potential buyer. Okay, um, when you live in a suburb too, what you'll find is that you'll actually start over a period of time, you'll start to notice social changes happening in the area as well. So what I've noticed over Balmain in the, last, the course of the last 10 years is that people typically move in when they're tw in their 20s, between 20 and 30, they move into the area. Then they meet their husband and wife. They originally move in, they buy a two-bedroom semi. Um, which is where their surplus is in the market. They stay over time, their situation changes, they get married, they start having children. They want to stay in the suburb, but the, that two-bedroom semi no longer actually suits them. It's become too small. So they look to offload the two-bedroom semi and they start to move in the same suburb into a larger family home. So that's called a social change. And once you've actually been in your target suburb for a little while, you'll actually start to notice that and it'll help you identify where the true demand is. In terms of um, identifying the demand within your suburb, also ask the agents. I mean, they've um, been in that suburb for quite some time as well, and they know where the demand is for properties as well. So I say to them, what sort of properties are actually selling? Where's the highest demand? What's in surplus supply? Okay. Um, now, attend open for inspections. Now, you need to start attending the open for inspections, and you need to do... So are you guys hot or is it just me? It's hot, it's just, I don't normally feel the heat, but um, guys, crew, can we get the air conditioning turned up? It's really hot up here. Um, if, uh, what you need to do is you need to start attending the open for inspection so you can visually observe who the buyers are coming through these properties, okay? So um, unfortunately, you will need to start setting aside um, attending the open for inspections every single Saturday and potentially attending them during the week if they have them in your suburb. So the good thing is that you really only need to do this for a period of 12 to 16 weeks. But let me tell you, if you go through the open for inspections every single Saturday, for a period of 12 weeks, I guarantee you, and you follow my due diligence system, at the 12-week mark, you're going to have a very good handle on the property values. And that's how long it took me by following my due diligence system. I became an expert literally at the 12-week 12, 12 mark of doing it continuously. I could pretty much get my finger spot on within a 50, 50 grand, uh, 50K range of where properties would end up selling at auction. So it is a discipline to train yourself in that. And it's only at that point. So if you remember this morning how I did the pricing disparity where I wrote two bedrooms, six to 900, blah, blah, blah. When you can do that, you know you've pretty much got your finger on the spot in terms of being an expert in the property values. Okay, attend auctions. So the visual, the open for inspections that you're going to attend where you're going through and inspecting properties, they're going to tell you who the buyers are, the types of demographics, types of buyers who are actually looking at buying in the area. And then by attending the auctions, that's going to tell you who's actually buying them, okay? So you can glean a lot of information by doing those two things. Okay, determine what the type and mix of housing is within your suburb. So you need to identify the housing styles within your suburb as well. Um, there's all different housing styles. There's freestanding houses, there's terraces, there's semis, there's um, apartments, there's townhouses, duplexes, there's all sorts. What is the type of housing in your suburb that you're focusing on, okay? Because what you don't want to do, you don't want to go into a suburb where a weatherboard cottage comes up that's unrenovated when literally 95% of the housing in your suburb is red brick houses, okay? Because weatherboard houses have a lower perceived value than a brick house. So um, I'll give you an example. One of my students, um, a lady that came to my workshop, she was looking at an unrenovated property in Leichhardt that came up a few weeks before the workshop. And it was actually a good little deal. And she said to me, um, after she came through the workshop afterwards, she said to me, look, I didn't buy that property because it was a timber weatherboard house. She said, I felt that um, buyers wouldn't value that as much. And I I actually said to her, timber weatherboard cottages are 
the predominant housing style within this suburb. And she's like, oh, I didn't know that. Um, so you've just got to understand what, what is the normal housing type. And the way that you determine this is really simply just to jump in your car, drive around the streets and actually have a look at what the housing styles are in your area. And also the, the, start, the character, so are they those, those, you know, those, those six types of housing types? Are they post-war, are they federation, are they Californian bungalows? What are they? If you can try and identify that, um, it's going to be much better for you. There's actually, um, again, on my RP data domain, when you do your suburb um, reports, you can actually um, get pull up these details too about the types of housing within your suburb. So what it's saying here in Balmain is that 26% of the housing is, is freestanding houses in Balmain. Um, medium density, which I take as being... Um, apartments, low-rise apartments is 40%, high density is 63%. So what it's saying is that 63% of the properties in Balmain are actually apartments. Now, I know that's not correct. I know that's not correct, so you don't want to base your decisions on stuff that's not factual. Okay. Review the local real estate agent website. So uh, again, in terms of getting to know your suburb, jump on the real estate, um, so LJ Hooker or whoever they may be in your suburbs and just jump on all six. If there's six real estate agents, jump on all six websites, start trawling through the properties that for sale. You're going to get a very good idea very quickly of the type of houses on the market, um, the size of houses and also the price ranges of suburbs in your suburb as well. Okay, meet with local real estate agents to get an insight into who the buyers are. So if you can, in terms of being your suburb due diligence, try and schedule a meeting with the agents or if they won't give you your time, at least start having conversations with them at the door of their open for inspections, okay? So when I started doing this in my early days, I'd always go up to the door and I'd say Chris or Monique or whoever it may be and I'd say, hey Chris, how's it going? Um, you know, how's the market been this week? So I just ask them really flippant questions like that. How's the market? How, you know, what's the, what's the buyers, any drop in the prices, are you noticing anything with the market? And they'd actually start having conversations with you about what's actually happening in your own suburb. So don't be afraid to ask that. Obviously, don't ask that question right at a busy period when there's 10 other people waiting to get in the property behind you. So try and time that if you can. All right, um, get, meet with local agents to get an insight into what type of property buyers want. So your agent will be able to answer all these questions. So if you are gutsy enough at that three-month mark, and you feel comfortable, I know some of you won't feel comfortable in doing this, but if you feel comfortable ringing up an agent, ring them up and say, hey, Chris, look, I've been doing my due diligence. I'm basically in a position where I'm ready to buy now. I'd like to come in and actually see you for that agent's briefing meeting. Um, just wanted to get your feeling and wanted to brief you of the type of property that I'm looking to buy. And also, I just wanted to get your thoughts in terms of where the demand is for the product. So I basically buy a property that, and create a product that's going to suit the demands of the market. So if you feel confident to do that, certainly do that. Because what you'll find is that I find that most agents are pretty willing to give you information if you actually ask for it. Okay, meet with local agents to gain insight into what the essential requirements of a property are. In some suburbs, in, your, in, your, in the physical house that you buy, there are certain expectations. I'll give you an example. In Pimble, in Pimble, anybody looking at Pimble around that area? Okay, one or two, good. Um, in Pimble, it is an expectation that you have a formal dining room. Nobody uses it, but you have to have a formal dining room. Okay, um, in Balmain, it's perfectly normal not to have a formal dining room. Okay, so in every single suburb, there are different aspects of what buyers expect you to put all the rooms. There's an expectation as to what rooms that property is going to um, contain. If you go into Pimble, for example, buyers will not tolerate, you know, when you've got like a sloping block. Um, so if you've got a sloping block like this. You know, it might be like a block of land like that. We've got a house here. <clears throat> and as a renovator, you can come in and basically like um, utilise the rooms, like the, like the subfloor space or come in and utilise this bottom area. You might come in down and put like another bedroom downstairs and a little, might relocate the laundry or whatever. In Pimble, that will not fly. Buyers in Pimble will not sleep in bedrooms below ground level, okay? Whereas in Balmain, they will. Okay, so you have to work out what is the expectation. And the only people that can tell you that is the agents because they know what will and won't work. I actually, um, on one of the projects that I, one of the big renovations that I did last year in Pimble, the owner next door asked me to renovate his house and I looked at his plans and uh, I said to him, you need to, so he went through the whole development application process, got it approved and I said to him, 
what you have got approved here, you might as well rip this development application in the bin because what you've, what the plans that you've got here, you are never going to sell the house. And he actually went and I said, look, I encourage you to go to a local real estate agent, show them these plans and get their thoughts before you actually go ahead and build this property because he didn't believe me. Fair enough. He went along to the real estate agent. Guess what the agent said? rip it up. So needless to say, he went through the whole process again and he redesigned the house based on what the requirements were. So his house didn't have a study, didn't ha it only had one garage, it's an expectation for two there, all sorts of things, fundamental flaws that he would have gone ahead and built this house thinking that you know he's going to make money on and it basically he'd go through the whole construction process and have a house at the end that would just sit on the market and that's not going to do anybody any favours. So make sure you, this is a really important point, make sure you check that with your real estate agent so you don't get tripped up on that. Okay, meet with uh, local agents to gain an insight into which properties are in surplus supply. So when you go into suburbs, um, it's very easy to um, buy a property that is a property that's really not in demand. So what you need to do as renovators, you need to buy the properties that are in demand and the ones that are not in surplus supply. Now there is an exception to the rule there. Sometimes it's okay to buy those properties that are in surplus supply if you can make them something else or if you can convert them into the property where there's demand for. So remember I mentioned that in Balmain there's a surplus of two bedroom semis? Well it's okay for me to buy those two bedroom semis if I can convert them into a four bedroom family home, okay? So just keep common sense in that regard. Um, properties, and it's very easy to tell properties that are in surplus supply because properties in surplus supply tend to be the properties that sell slower and they're the ones that agents are chasing you, not you chasing the agents for the information. Um, uh, meet with the agents to gain an insight into which properties are in high demand. Okay, actually I think that's a double up there. Um, yeah. So you need to just work out which properties are in high demand, which are in low, and your agent can help you with that information, okay? You'll also see by attending those open for inspections and the auctions, you'll also notice which properties are selling, which properties are getting snapped up quicker, and which are just sitting on the market. So those open for inspections and the auctions are so critical in terms of your learning. Okay, did conduct an internet search to determine the auction clearance rates. So some suburbs auctions are very prevalent. So a good way to work out how strong a suburb is in terms of the demand levels is to look at the auction clearance rates as well. So you can type in Balmain auction clearance rate that will pop up on the internet very readily. Um, a lot of the newspapers also publish this and magazines like Australian Property Investor Magazine also cover that as well. Okay, uh, so we've done that one. Okay, in your suburb, you need to do an internet search on what is the average time, average number of days that properties sit on the market before they get sold. Now, why would you possibly need to know how long it takes to sell properties in your area? Holding cost. Holding cost. Where would this be particularly relevant? In what, in what areas? Regional areas, okay? So in regional areas, what you want to do is you basically want to, um, in any suburb really, you want to work out what is the average holding time. Now in my suburb, I know that the average time on market is around 40 to 50 days. In country areas like Wagga Wagga, you need to work on 90 or 100 days to sell your property. So in the country areas, properties definitely do take longer to sell um, and you need to factor that into your feasibility. Sorry, Lisa, is that till end of step two or step three? Okay, great. I actually think I'm ahead of time now. Um, okay, conduct an internet search. Sorry, Lisa, is, is afternoon tea ready early? Okay, and what time are we now? 20? Yeah, bring it forward. I'm actually on time. I think that's the first time ever in my whole life I've been on time with my presentation. Um, <laughs> yay! What, you don't want to be here till 10 o'clock tonight? Okay, all right. Um, conduct an internet search. So what is the average days on the market for properties to be sold? Okay. Um, assess how good or bad the infrastructure is within a suburb. So one of the checks that you want to go into a suburb is people have to live normal day-to-day -day lives in their suburb. That's reality. So you have to make sure there's a supermarket, shops. You need to make sure there's a bus station, train, whatever it may be, you need facilities, you need infrastructure for people to be able to go about their day-to-day -day lives in a very practical manner. And look, the only way that you do this is, again, you can fly over it via Google Earth and sort of zoom on areas, but the best way to do this is to drive the streets, jump in your car, walk the streets, whatever it may be, and see how good the infrastructure is within your suburb. Because if your suburb doesn't have good infrastructure, it's going to be a lower value suburb, that's reality. 
Okay. So um, how good, uh, assess how good or bad the public uh, transport systems are, the public links. So that's primarily the bus, train, um, freeway access and planes, trains. What am I missing? Rail. Yep. Okay, well, there we go. Ferries, freeways, bus stops, train lines, ferries and also the airport as well. So in inner city locations, people like being close to the airport as well, being affluent, more affluent people, a um, lot more people spending time at the airport. Okay. Review the website of the local council. Now, in terms of assessing how tough your suburb's going to be or how good it's going to be, um, what you can do is you can actually go into your local government website. So you can jump on, for example, Leichhardt like Council in my suburb, and you can actually start to see how long it's taking for development applications to be approved. So you can see when people, through that development application thing that I took you through this morning, you can see when people lodge their development application and when they're typically getting approved. So that will actually tell you a very good indicator as to what the average average lead time is for uh, the, approve, the council approval process in your area as well. Um, in terms of your suburb, you need to assess what major developments are going in. So um, suburbs don't always stay the same. There are developments that go into a suburb which negatively impact a suburb. I'll give you two examples in Balmain. About um, eight years ago, Balmain Shores went into Balmain. There was about five or 600 apartments that went in in one hit. It absolutely destroyed the rental market in Balmain literally overnight, okay? We're now facing um, Balmain Leagues, Bal you know, Balmain's Leagues Club. It's being knocked down and a 20-storey residential tower is going up on Victoria Road as we speak. Absolutely ludicrous stuff. I uh, don't know how they ever got that passed through council. And there's been major objective groups to stop that development. Um, and so the reality is, is that I know now, I actually, um, there was a property that come on the market about three weeks ago. And I had one of the agents call me and say, Sheree, this property's coming on the market. Um, call, you know, I got that phone call before the property came on the market. And I said, where is it located? And it was actually one street back, or sorry, two streets back from that major development. I said, no, thank you. I said, it's next to the 20-storey the um, monstrosity that's going up at Balmain Leagues Club. I know that once that league club's, that once that 20-storey residential tower goes up, basically all those surrounding streets are going to become a traffic jam. That pocket already is a traffic jam and basically with another 200 apartments, it's going to be so bad there. I've now written those streets off as no-go zones for me as a professional renovator developer. And so what you want to do is you want to go into council and you want to make sure you know where these negative, um, these negative developments are going because they always happen in one state, shape or form. They always happen in your suburb. So what you want to do is you want to start um, reading your local paper as well so um, most of your suburbs you know just your normal your normal paper your local um, sorry I just read it just get into the habit you don't have to read your local paper in its entirety but make sure in the suburb that you're going to become an expert in make sure you quickly flick through because the reality is council the local media they will always report months and months and months in advance if there's some negative development or something weird that's happening in your suburb that's going to affect your suburb either positively or negatively in some way shape or form so what you want to do is you want to basically um, pull those out you want to cut cut the news whatever the clipping is cut it out and you should really keep that and you should file it in your property due diligence system when you need it. Okay. Is there, in your suburb, is there economic vibrancy? I know that in some... Have you got any Newcastle people in the room? Okay, a few of you. Fantastic long drive this morning. Um, in some suburbs, like for example in Newcastle, you go to Newcastle, half the retail shops have closed there now. So that says to me, oh, there's something going on here. Like it's not, you know, we're not riding Newcastle. There's plenty of opportunities in, in some parts of Newcastle. But you have to go into suburbs where basically the businesses are surviving because if they're not surviving, that is an indicator that something is happening in your suburb in order for those businesses to be closing down. So do a quick drive through and just make sure that all the shops are basically there. I mean, I go into one of my, my where my sister lives, Claremont Meadows. They've got a shopping centre there. Eight out of the ten shops there are vacant. So what's that telling me? It's telling us there's, there's some issue there, there's some demand issue there. The, the economy is not strong there. So economic vibrancy. Okay, um, is your suburb reliant on one market? Can you give me an example of suburbs that might be reliant on one market? I know all the Perth people will be able to answer this. Mining, okay. Uh, my dad, where my dad lives, 
Golgong, you know, that's pretty much uh, a lot of the people that live there are mining as well. Just got to be careful when you're looking at individual suburbs like that because the reality is mines shut and they close, um, you know, within, they can shut, you know, within the space of months or a year or whatever it may be. So you've just got to make sure it's sort of dangerous going into suburbs where this whole suburb is underpinned by one certain thing. And certainly, look, most of you won't have this problem, but it'd be negligent of me not to point that out for you as a consideration when you are trying to become an expert in a particular suburb. All right. Um, is the success of your suburb dependent on the weather seasons? Can you think of, I don't know, one springs to mind right away, some suburbs where properties are good in some months and not so good in other months? Could you? Bondi? Yep, Bondi is definitely one. Byron Bay. What's the best time to sell a property in Byron Bay? Christmas. Everybody go, and I'm guilty, you go to Byron Bay for holiday, you end up coming back with not a bikini or a beach towel, but a house. So um, there are some, so that's why I'm saying like, I, I'm saying some of these things like saying the worst time of the year to, to sell a property is Christmas and generally it is, but there are some individual suburb factors where it can be the complete opposite like Byron Bay, where it is the best time to sell your property in the summer months when everybody's on holiday and they don't really, they go by an emotional decision and look back five years later and go, what was I thinking? So um, always check that. I mean, some of the... Um, so I guess also as renovators, you need to be conscious of the weather seasons because typically the cooler months, uh, sorry, the hotter months are the best time to sell in any coastal properties. So, you know, all those sort of properties around the northern beaches, um, just there's so, there's so many peninsula suburbs, not funny, but the, the warmer months are definitely the best months to sell those. Okay. Speak to locals in your area. If you really want to find out about a suburb, guess who you talk to? You talk to Nanny and Poppy at the gate somewhere. So um, a lot of older people are more than willing to sit there and talk to you for three hours. Um, so I've been able to find out a lot of information by individual properties um, on the suburb level in one some way, shape or form. So speak to your locals. So go into your local, sh your local shops and um, in your suburb and just say to, the, say to the shopkeepers, just in casual conversation, hey, uh, I'm thinking about doing um, developing in this area. I'm looking to develop some properties in this area. What do you, do you know any people who are doing it successfully? Um, what are your thoughts? You know, who are the type of people that are coming in your shop? Who are your customers? So people are more than happy, happy to have a general friendly chit chat to you. And it can just be another thing to arm you against to make sure you're getting your suburb due diligence right. So some of the questions you asked, what's the area like? What are the type of people living there? Um, do you like living here? What are the good points, the bad points? So it just doesn't have to be shopkeepers. It's, the, it's people in the street, people down the park, whatever it may be. Just ask as many questions. If you ask, you don't receive. Okay. What's that? If you don't ask. What did I say? I do that a lot. I've been told. I actually say something and it comes out complete opposite, but most people just go, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this time of night, they really don't care what I say. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, read local newspapers and community updates as well. So um, as I said, you want to be reading your local paper. Now, what I want you to do as renovators, I want you to start cutting out any clippings in the newspaper, the local newspaper and those, you know, those neighborhood watch things that you get in your letterbox. Um, I want you to start clipping out any positive newspaper articles. So for example, uh, this is one that I picked out this morning. Um, so what you want to do is, I quickly flick through, I haven't actually read this week's paper. Have you guys heard that the world is blowing up in the next couple of days? My sister told me, I said, are you on drugs or something? Have you guys heard that or is it just me not watching the news? It is blowing up? Is that right? No? Okay. All right. Um, so what you do... I want you to start pulling out... Uh, there's nothing here this week. But what I do, architect tips to add value to your home. Um, yeah, probably right. Um, so what you want to do is you want to, if there's a positive newspaper article in your magazine, um, for example, you know, in a lot of stuff that comes through our pa newspapers in the local community, is just stuff like it might say baby, 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 um, baby boom in Balmain or whatever it may be, or um, Balmain property prices on the rise, whatever it may be. 
anything, any positive media article, I want you to clip it out and I want you to start to file this under your due diligence system. There's actually a uh, section in your due diligence system that you'll get um, shortly and I want you to basically pull these media clippings out because when you start to do things like your finance proposal and your, spot of, your spotters reports, what you're doing is you're going to photocopy these newspaper, uh, these media clippings and you're actually going to put them into those reports to, to basically sell the property to other people and to get your finance across the line. Because what you're trying to prove is that there's strong demand, the suburb that you are investing in is rock solid. Okay, are there community objective groups in your suburb? Now the community objective groups, I spoke about these earlier today, and what they are is they're the people who try and stop development. Now they're, they're quite comical, these groups, um, however, they also are very, very good groups to actually learn from as well. Now these people in the objective groups, so what I would suggest that um, when you see these rallies, you know these rallies and things, just maybe attend, if you can tolerate it, maybe just attend a couple of them, one of them or two of them, or at least quite often what they do is they actually send out newsletters in your letterbox, just like a, a photocopy letter saying we had this success or whatever. And I would encourage you to read all of those and potentially keep them because the people that are in these objective groups, they're actually really smart people. What they do, sorry, um, guys, did we find my LEP DCP? Oh, has it? Whereabouts is it? If we can hold up. Can I just grab that? Um, sorry, can I get one of the crew members to grab that? I'm making the crew work today. Um, oh. oh, thank you. Teamwork. Thank you. Um, this is the Bible. So as this goes around, it's absolutely, absolutely boring. If you, if you, anybody have a sleeping problem in this room? Ap sleep apnea? Buy one of these, your medical condition is solved. Um, this, is the, this is the Bible of councils, okay, and this is what they determine whether or not your development application gets proved or not. Now, these people in these objective groups, what they do is they sit there and they read every single detail and they look for loopholes and they're really smart people. They, got, they typically have a lot of time on their hands and um, they read everything and they just come up with objections and they stop stuff actually happening. So they're really good ones for you to learn. Like, like certainly if, if you can't tolerate going to the actual ward meetings, these are the, these are the objective groups. They're like a Jerry Springer show. Um, this is where you get people going and they'll, like the, the council will hold a big town rally meeting. Has anybody ever been to these? Yep. It seriously is like a Jerry Springer show. So you get a town. You get town people going there, and uh, the councils will be there, and the developers of you know whoever proposing. Like, I'll give you an example in Balmain Ballast Point, um, the old Caltex refinery. Um, a guy bought that, and he was going to knock down the old, take, remove the old um, Caltex refinery, and he bought the site for six million dollars. He was going to put forty-three luxury homes on the site, and everybody in Balmain went into outrage mode. And so he had to basically go to a public ward meeting, like a public meeting. And I actually went to that meeting, and people were like, it, like they might as well have had his head on a stake on a picket or whatever. And they were just basically like screaming out, "You big greedy, angry developer!" And then there was other people going. As per clause 4.3 choice of the DCP, you are not says you are not allowed to do blah 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 whatever, right? So they're actually really interesting ones for you to learn from. And if you're looking for a cheap night out of entertainment, <laughs> this is the place you go. All right. So you have to make sure that um, you know community objective groups um, at, at the very minimum read the stuff they put in your letterbox, and you're only going to get these sort of notifications if you are in those heritage and conservation inner city, in, primarily in the inner city ring. If you're doing Dealing in those outer metropolitan suburbs, you're probably not going to have these um, vocal community objector groups. Um, this is this little article there. Like for example, here, so like this is this is the sort of stuff you can expect to get in your letterbox if you are dealing in inner city locations, right across. And it's just not a, not just in Sydney; it's right across the whole country. Okay, <laughs> this is one that they put out. The objectors put out. And they said demolition by neglect, and I thought. That is a really smart strategy. So what they basically, and I've never done it, unfortunately, but um, what they did is the council wouldn't let them knock down this building, so they pretty much said, we're going to sit on it until it falls down and then you have no choice. So it's called demolition by neglect. So see how I thought, okay, that's really smart little, I mean, that's a quirky example, but they put this sort of stuff that makes you thinking, oh, maybe I could do something this way. So, yeah. Of course, I would never do anything like that, all right? Um, remember, renovate with a conscience, you know, do the right thing. 
Okay, does your suburb have community ward meetings? Now, this is another great way. Um, reality is if when you lodge a development application, if you have more than four objections, it no longer gets, um, it has to go to what's called a community ward meeting. And a community ward meeting is where all the councillors actually stand in, um, sit in a room and then all the people come who have got the development application who are supporting and objecting against the development application. So it typically is for more than four objections. So you definitely, as renovators, want to aim for four or less because once it hits, the, sorry, three or less, because once it hits the four mark, it'll get delayed and it'll actually go to another stage. So it means you have to go in. So quite often in Balmain, like our council will hire Balmain Town Hall or Leica Town Hall. All the councillors will be there, all in a like half semicircle. They'll pretty much get up and they'll say, okay, we're now hearing um, applications of support and objection for the property at number 48 Smith Street, Balmain. Um, all those in objection, please stand up. So then you'll have five people stand up from the audience and the council would like to say, who would like to go first in terms of um, stating your objection? So next door neighbour will um, get up and they normally, quite often neighbours who are very emotionally connected, you know, very unreceptive to change, will get up and say, look, I oppose this development because they're going to be peering in my kitchen window, they've taken away my sunlight, um, they're overdeveloping the land, um, I'm not going to have any peace and quiet, my life's destroyed, I'm, I'm going to, my marriage is going to break up and blah, 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 blah. So they quite often over-exaggerate the problems um, and they can be, again, that, that this can be, as I said, a, a cheap night out. Um, I had to go to one a couple of months ago on behalf of one of my students and I, luckily I managed to save the development application for them. So the only reason why I, I was able to manage to get their DA through is because I had experience in watching these sorts of things. They were absolutely petrified at the, even the prospect of going to a ward meeting. I'm just trying to think of what the example was. Um, the example was is that um, they had a two, they were doing a structural renovation, two-storey addition, and they had a balcony on what, the main bedroom and they had a balcony on the second room. And basically the council said, we're going to approve this application, but the neighbour wanted it to be pulled back in. So they were happy to approve it. They said, what we'd like to do is we'd like to delete the, um, the upstairs rear balcony. And I said to her, let that go. It's not critical. Like, let it go. You want a development application. And then so they, they agreed with that. And then they actually said, now the room downstairs... Um, sorry, they said the second bedroom upstairs, we want to pull that back in. And my student just sat there, didn't know how to take that. And I immediately got up and I said, um, I'd like to just basically rise a point that we, not, we really wouldn't like to um, reduce that second bedroom because the room downstairs, the rooms are extremely thin. So if we reduce that room, we're going to have practically unusable rooms. And I was really over-exaggerating it. Um, and I said, so what I'd be doing is we're more than happy to lose the deck if you're happy to keep the upstairs second bedroom. And they all went, um, blah, blah, blah. They, they discussed it for about 20 seconds. They said, that's fine, approved. So I only had experience. I sort of captured. Now, my student probably wouldn't have got that. She probably would have. They would have pulled her building back in probably another metre because she didn't have the experience of going to those community ward meetings. So when I first started in renovating, I attended literally all of those ward meetings every single month. They have them once a month. And it's really important. So if your own suburb doesn't have them, please go log on to the Leichhardt Town, um, ring up Leichhardt Council and just ask them as a very good, um, you know, just exercise to at least watch them once in your life. Go and sit there for the whole two or three hours. They'll hear like 10 applications and it's a really good way for you to learn the things that council do like and what they don't like. So by what just listening on those meetings, what you'll find is that you'll actually start to learn what's being approved and what's not being approved and what not to do when, it's, when it comes time to submitting your development application. So as I said, they're really interesting. There's lots of tears. People get very emotional, the neighbours. Um, and then you have an opportunity as the developer, you, after everybody said no, 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 you have the opportunity to get up with your architect and yourself and say, you know, I'm councillors, um, this application should be approved. It complies with every single development control. It doesn't take away the neighbour's lights, um, piece of, you know, um, amenity. It doesn't do this, blah, blah, blah. Yes, um, that is slightly over. So, you know, councillor, I'd be willing to cut that back a little bit on that side because at the end of the day, you just want a development approval. It doesn't matter if your room is slightly one metre length. So there's a little bit of give and take there. So definitely try and attend at least one in your, you know, in the next couple of months. And for those people interstate, if you just focus, because obviously when you go into the outer suburbs, ward meetings aren't as prevalent. Um, they still have them in the majority of councils, but in for everybody interstate, like in the Perth, Adelaide people, um, just try and attend at least one ward meeting in somewhere in a council in the inner. So in Brisbane, it'd be Brisbane City Council. We'll have them every single month. Just attend one. The more you can attend, the better. Okay. Okay. Um, 
network with local real estate agents. So try and get in the habit, if you can, start making the real estate agents your new best friend. So I have um, really good relationships with a lot of agents in, um, in, in Balmain, and it's only because uh, I'm nice to them, I invest some time in them, um, you know, I go out and have, take them out to coffee. So I don't be onerous in terms of restricting their time, but I'll just say, hey, Chris, um, you want to go to the cafe and just grab some quick lunch or grab a quick coffee or have a quick chat. So um, just try and make it really easy to do business with. Because the reality is if they like you, it is going to be so much easier for them to bring deals and you will get those deals in advance of everybody else from the general public. Okay. Know where your suburb boundaries start and, so, uh, start and stop, stop. Now, in RP data, you need to be careful of this. Some real estate agents sell a suburb and they'll actually put the more expensive suburb as, so what they quite often mind, they'll say Balmain location. So people think it's Balmain, but on title it might be Roselle. Huge difference in price. So when you're on RP data, what you can do is you can actually, um, actually, I don't know if my computer has this, you can actually tell where the suburb lines stop and start. In fact, I think I've got a PowerPoint slide on this one. Might be quicker. Oh, here we go. When you use RP data, see that red line there? That is basically the end of the suburb and the start of a new suburb. That's called a suburb boundary line. So here in Balmain, College Street has, this is Balmain, this is Birchgrove. Birchgrove's the posh part of Balmain. Um, suburb, you know, property values here are going to be a couple of hundred thousand dollars lower than property values over here. So you need to know where the suburb boundaries start and stop. So you just don't want to make a mistake as a renovator thinking that you're buying in Balmain here, like here. Um, you know, radically different value in, in, in Curtis Road here than Church Street. Okay, so just know where your suburb boundary line stop and start so you can make sure that you are truly buying in um, the suburb that you think you're buying. You can also cross-reference this on the title, so always make sure when you buy a property you check the title, the address of the title on the contract of sale. Okay. Read credible media publications. So um, quite often, you know, these magazines like um, Property Investor Magazine, um, Smart... Uh, your mortgage, you know, Smart Property Investor Magazine, Your Investment Property Magazine, um, and Smart, but I'm going to be on the cover of Smart Property Investor Magazine, I think, in next month or July. So, um, yeah, read them, because quite often these, prop these property-related magazines, they always do suburb profiles on suburbs as well. So if anything, if your suburb is profiled in any way, rip it out, and that's all going to go into all that other stuff you're going to produce to get your finance and your spotters fees across the line. Okay, don't worry guys, we're on the home stretch. Um, public housing. So in your suburb, you need to know where public housing is located. Every suburb in Australia has public housing. There are some suburbs where the whole suburb is public housing. I gave you an example earlier of Birmingham. Um, Balmain has public housing. 13.1% of houses in Balmain, highly desirable suburb, has housing commission. Now housing commission housing is not so bad when it's scattered when a house is here and there, where the problem lies is where Housing Commission is all in one central block. I think I have a, no, I don't have an image. But basically, uh, one of the properties that I bought had public housing locating right across the, the other side of the road, and I didn't actually realise that. It was one of my, I think it was my second or third project in where I didn't actually um, do my due diligence in that regard. So definitely, um, look, I'm not going to discriminate you know, uh, each to their own, but you've just got to be conscious of that where public housing is all conglomerated in one section, you've got a higher incidence of issues with, um, that you can expect with those suburbs. Yep, Mike's down here. Sorry, I'm just wondering how you find out where the public housing is located. Um, so if you go onto the Department of Public Housing website, they used to have a button. You could type in your suburb and it would tell you what percentage of your suburb is actually public housing. So you just obviously want to go the lower the better. Um, and I'm not sure, I haven't been on the public housing website of recent, but um, they used to have a button. I think they've overhauled their site now. If, you can't, if it's not on the website, I would ring and ask them. They've certainly got that, that data available. All right, thanks. Is there another question here somewhere? No? Okay, cool. All right. Um, utilise government websites for planning data. So um, all of those Queensland government, Victorian government, Department of Fair Trading, um, all of those government websites do quite have like have so many reports on them on individual suburbs. It's not funny. So you just got to spend a couple of hours trawling through the internet. Any juicy piece of information that you think you can use in your finance proposals, your valuers' proposals, your spotters' fees reports, pull it out. 
Get it once, print it out once and file it away because you're going to use that continuously over a lot of things that you do. Okay, um, do the self-test and if, does your suburb have a good positive feeling? So if it's a suburb that you feel that you would live in, then chances are that somebody else is going to share that feeling as well. You know what's a good suburb, you know what's a bad, so don't, don't ever go into bad suburbs, they're bad for a reason. Okay, any questions or answers? So that's pretty much about 45 things you can do to become an expert in your suburb. The main ones are if you can live in them and start spending time and networking with the agents, they're the main ones to really becoming an expert at, at a suburb level.